So we have a lot to discuss about the clothing in The Nevers, which is without a doubt, by far, my most favorite TV series to have come out this year, and that is entirely independent of the fact that HBO's The Nevers is actually sponsoring this video. But aside from the fact that I have been obsessively watching the show, i.e. I have seen every episode of the episodes that are out at least three times. Okay, this show is a sci-fi fantasy, clearly does not take place in our universe as we know it today on our timeline. It clearly takes place in some sort of alternate parallel universe where historical accuracy is not at all probably something that should be the, the pinnacle of concern within the design of the show. The storyline is set in 1896 according to this parallel timeline. However, the clothing that we do see appearing throughout this series adheres remarkably to the historical evidence of our own 1896 that we have. I feel like with the design of a lot of sci-fi fantasy that is sort of used as a pass or an excuse to not really look into historical research so much. However, I think the design team for this show actually took the opposite approach. You can tell a whole lot of research was done into what people in an 1890s that we would understand would have looked like in order to make it feel like something that we could open up a history book and look up and read about today. But that is not what we're here to discuss, because as I have been watching this series, I was absolutely mind blown and amazed at the stellar job that the series perhaps completely accidentally does in busting all of these preconceived myths on the impracticality and constrictiveness of period dress. This show busts them all. So backing up for a second, if you have not got into this wonderful world that is The Nevers, basically the premise of the show is that certain people in society primarily women and people of working classes and people who typically don't hold the most power in society have all of a sudden been given these superhuman abilities. Because these abilities are given to people in society who, according to the societal structure that has been established at the time, which is remarkably similar to the societal construction of the 1890s period in our own historical timeline, this also begins to highly concern a lot of the people who hold the power structures in the society who have coincidentally or not coincidentally not been given these turns or been touched as it is referred to in the show. So the actual storyline follows a group of these touched people who have banded together into this sort of orphanage safe haven space, which is run by Amalia True, who is herself touched questionably, but Loki also isn't human. I have theories. We don't really know what her deal is right now, but she is a fierce fighter, despite the impediment of her period clothing. The characters in this show, not only the fictional characters, but the actors as well, because we have to think about the fact that these people are wearing period clothes, and they are clearly wearing period clothes in the manner that they are meant to be worn. They are wearing cuts, silhouettes, understructures, things are worn in the layers and composition in which the evidence of history shows us they were supposed to be worn, but the characters themselves, as well as the actors who are physically in the clothing on set, are doing these incredible stunts in corsets, in petticoats, in dresses, in heavy coats, in all these garments that we have the perception are restrictive and that prevent movement. This show is a primary example of like expert level humans who know how to move in period clothing and all of the amazing things that the human body can do despite wearing period clothing. So let us examine this. As well as pointing out, because nothing is exempt of any and all fault, some little moments of implausible logic, shall we say. So throughout the whole beginning sequence of episode one, when we see the two sort of main characters, we can see already that the level of detail that is placed into the historical intricacies of these clothes are really astoundingly good. We've got these iconic 1890s coats, not only on the two main ladies, but on all of the background people that we can see as they walk through the town with the big sleeves, with the big lapels. They are just perfect. Thankfully, this is not a show that suffers from modern blouse syndrome, which is something that I have addressed in previous costume reviews, but generally in a lot of these, especially late 19th century and early Edwardian period dramas, it is a tendency of a lot of costume departments to capitalize on the recent fad for Victorian-inspired, Edwardian-inspired blouses that grace the high street shops. But despite the fact that this is sci-fi fantasy, I do think there is a huge benefit in nailing, especially the design elements into an identifiable period in our timeline of history, especially because clearly this is supposed to be a commentary on a lot of issues that are going on in today's society, which I think particularly highlights the 
brilliant decision to set this story in the 1890s. I don't know whose decision this was, um, certainly not the costume designer's decision, but especially to play up the identifiable historical evidence in the clothes to the actual 1890s as we know them in our modern timeline. Modern timeline? timeline of our reality, I guess. So the Rational Dress Movement, well, the Rational Dress Society was established in London in 1881. And this was a society of women whose primary concern was to sort of dissolve the societal expectations that women's dress had to be restrictively fashionable and who were actively promoting comfortable, wearable, movable, practical dress. As I should say, fashionable and socially acceptable means of dress because Obviously, working women have been functioning very practically in their period dress for centuries, but this was particularly a group of high society and fashionable women who were advocating for the social acceptability of the clothing that they wore. But all of this is to say that the late 19th century, particularly in the 1890s at the turn of the Edwardian period, there was in London this huge cultural progression towards rational, practical dress, as well as health, physical fitness. We can see in a lot of the magazines and advertisements in this period, there is a lot of discourse and discussion on what is considered healthy versus what is considered not healthy. We get into the whole issue of obviously health in corsetry, which is incidentally heavily debated by men. But we also see a lot of advertisements in this period as advertising just the most basic household products, face creams, corsets, as health corsets, health this, this is healthy for you. The end of the 19th century also begins to see a huge move towards encouraging women towards physical activity and towards exercise. So there are more and more women taking up physical sports such as tennis, golf, swimming, cycling, and there's introduced clothing to assist with the movements necessary for those. Clothing, I should mention, that looks absolutely nothing like the athletic wear that we wear today. They're wearing split skirts, they're wearing athletic corsets, they're wearing what we would view as period dress and what our modern society would still claim as being restrictive, but they were able to move perfectly fine. And this is what we're supposed to be exploring right now. So having this sort of background cultural understanding of what was going on in the 1890s as we understand the 1890s to have been, these women and these characters are sort of existing in that cultural context. And that's important to keep in mind as we watch this series. <laughs> Might we be civil? So if we want to talk about what you can and cannot do in a corset, that's pretty telling. We can tell, first of all, throughout the entire beginning sequence of this entire first episode, that these women are properly understructured. It's clear from the silhouette, it's clear from the position of the bust, it's clear from the way that the clothes sit on the body. These women are wearing corsets. These women are wearing corsets appropriate to this specific time period. I know a lot of you who watch this channel are probably well and truly done listening to me talk about all of the things that can be done in corsets, but for those of you who are new to this world, hello. Welcome. Corsets, particularly in this latter half of the 19th century, are very lightly and very minimally boned. If they are made of whalebone, the whalebone strips are so narrow and so thin, not width-wise, but thickness-wise, they're like one to two millimeters thick. It's like the thickness of your fingernail. Just hypothetically here, True is not wearing a fashion corset. She's wearing something like the Pretty Housemaid, or she's wearing something that gives her the support and the structure that she needs, but is not going to impede her torso movements because she's she's going out in the world and she's getting herself in fights. Like, she's not taking that chance. We see her ducking knives and stuff, and she has no problem doing any of that in a corset. Not only the character of True, but the actress herself who is doing this. I'm not sure if Laura Donnelly is doing all of her own stunts or if there is a separate stunt person. But regardless, as we will explore throughout this, well, the first four episodes of the series that are out, Laura Donnelly is an expert at wearing period clothes. We'll talk about that more later. So here we have our first little bit of questionable logic in regards to clothing physics. So as we can see, the wound that she gets on her middle where she would be wearing a corset because we know she is because we saw her wearing a corset. It's a bit too horizontal to have been cleanly made with the obstruction of 
stays, whether that is steels or whalebone. I think it's whalebone. The placement of that wound and how far it goes across the body, you would have run into a bone or two at some point there. It is plausible because whalebone does soften with heat and moisture, and that's obviously how it is cut to shape to go into the actual corsets when they're being made. Maybe I could suspend my disbelief in that because she is active, she is hot and she's sweating, and so the whalebone would be softer. Whalebone, I, I guess it kind of has a grain. It's got, you know, it's made out of, so it's not skeleton. It's not like whale skeleton. It is the baleen, it's the jaw piece in the whale of the, the filtery stuff that comes through. It's not the strings, but it's the fiber stuff in the jaw that turns into the stringy stuff. The point being, whalebone has that vertical grain to it, and if you look at a piece of whalebone up close, it almost looks like a lot of those strings sort of packed together. The point being, it is a lot easier to cut vertically on whalebone than it is to cut across. I have some questions about this moment, but we're gonna move on. Clearly what Melody is wearing is supposed to be a costume. She is her own world, but I have to appreciate the ingenuity of her corset bodice thing being a straight jacket. And as we can see later on throughout the series, Melody in particular is not a fan of wearing anything tight on her upper body. So I think it's really interesting that the first, is this the first time we see her? Or the first time that we're really introduced to her character. Maybe we'll see her in other things throughout the series and maybe my theory will be contradicted, but the only tight fitting garment she's wearing on the top portion of her body is a mutilated straight jacket. Clever. So the end of episode one is when we get another big fight scene with a lot to comment on. First of all, they almost, almost lost me at the point where she leaps off the balcony and has her dress torn off and then all of a sudden she's conveniently fighting in her underwear. Did that need to happen? No. Did we get to see her historically correct undergarments because of that? Yes, so I mildly forgive them. After I had a moment to properly appreciate the fact that she was wearing a chemise and the fact that her petticoat had a gazillion pin tucks in it, we have to once again pay attention to the corset and we can see how few bones that she's got in this corset. We can also see exactly the placement of the bones in her corset, which come right across her front and would impede a knife going through there, but that's, we're moving on. This is not the same corset that she was wearing earlier in the day because if the knife punctured deeply enough to cut her, the corset itself would have been cut. So she is wearing a different corset, we know for several reasons, primarily being the fact that she comments on the fact that she doesn't feel comfortable in her clothes when they're in the carriage on the way there. It should be noted, they are intentionally wearing high fashion garments that are not supposed to be comfortable. And yet, despite that, despite this being her uncomfortable corset, her evening corset, her fashion corset, she still fights people in it. Once again, both the character, True, as well as the actress, whoever this is performing the stunts in this, clearly is not impeded by her corset. So this video was actually shot before episodes three and four were released, which means I did not get to see and therefore comment on the little behind the scenes sneak peek of how they shot the lake fight scene in which we actually get, first of all, we get confirmation that Laura Donnelly is doing most of her own stunts in this series. However, there is footage of the stunt double doing a rehearsal of this lake fight scene in which the stunt double, who is not even on camera, is very clearly, she's wearing some sort of amalgamation of period clothes. She's wearing the long skirt and she's wearing a corset. She's not even on camera. She is literally just rehearsing this scene and she is properly understructured. I have so much respect. And we do have characters in not historically accurate clothing like Bonfire Annie, who is the character with the flames. So one thing that Michelle Clapton, who is the designer of The Nevers, and who is incidentally also the designer of Game of Thrones, one thing that I feel like she does really, really well, like she is expert at historical accuracy, and not just in the sense of doing the research, but the seed of the concept of historical accuracy is the ability to follow a set of rules. That's kind of really all that it is. Whether it is a fantasy series where you have to create your own rules and your own societal structures that different types and classes and purposes of people have to be following, or whether those rules are pre-established because that's what happened in our own historical timeline. The clothes in the Nevers are not 100% historically accurate. First of all, there is no such thing as historical accuracy. There are deviations from the evidence of history that we have in this show, but those are deviations that are taken under very clear sets of rule structures. But it seems like there is some sort of divide between 
the people who have just discovered their abilities, who have just come into this orphanage, from of course the like average people who are still out in like normal people London, from the people like Malady and like Bonfire Annie who have gone very deep underground into this like other world of touched people. So whereas we don't necessarily see historical evidence for what Bonfire Annie is wearing in our own historical contexts, she still seems to make sense within the world of the story, which is why I think I'm so thrown off by the character of Mary, who there's no historical evidence for what she wears or what her face or hair look like beyond like the renaissance fair. Okay so the character of Mary was a point that I had addressed in the video but then I cut it for the video because it just went on for like nine eternities but basically when we first see Mary she is on stage she is technically wearing a costume so obviously historical accuracy is not the goal here however the costume was slightly more on the Ren Faire side but it was more so the hair and makeup that completely threw me off with her whole look in this first scene because whereas the characters of Malady and Bonfire Annie are clearly wearing a lot of very modern makeup, they exist on the opposite side of the historical spectrum whereas the character of Mary is supposed to theoretically, as we perceive right now, supposed to exist on the extremely historical side of the spectrum. So she's a little bit of a disruptor to the whole order of the rules that I am perceiving from this show which is why I was very thrown by her look. To be fair, her clothes do get a lot better throughout the rest of the episodes that I've seen. Her hair and makeup still skew a little bit more to the modern, but it is nothing that we like cannot deal with. But again, with characters like Malady, who is very deep into this like underground world of Touched, what is done with her clothes is really interesting. So I know I pointed out the bit about the straight jacket earlier, but in this scene, this scene is hilariously brilliant because I brought up earlier the fact that she kind of likes to go against the fashionable silhouettes that are being worn by the regular people on the outside, in the outside world. Here, we see this very literally shown. She's wearing a bodice, what actually looks like an earlier 19th century, like 1880s or 1870s bodice inside out. She's got seam allowances on her arms eyes, she's got the boning channels on the outside of her garments, which are supposed to be inside obviously, and when she turns around you can see the back, you can see the waist tape that actually is stitched into a lot of these 19th century bodices to hold it in so that you don't end up with gaping. First of all is a detail of historical dress that you have to have looked at extant garments to know. Whether this is a rental or was constructed for the purposes of the show, I'm not sure, but the detail of that is just so ingenious, this idea of her turning the world inside out, turning the mind inside out. Oh, it's just so cool. So if we want to talk about abdominal wounds, in theory, in that positioning, she could very well have shot herself through the bones of her corset, which would in theory at least slow down a bit of the impact of the bullet if that's really what she was intending to do. Why that wasn't mentioned is beyond me. It looks to me like she is very heavily corseted in this, and granted it's not terribly difficult to achieve a dramatic shape like this if you pad out your hips and your bust, which is why I was a bit thrown off by this one scene at the end of episode three where we actually see her in her underwear and we can see the lower line of her corset where it doesn't appear that she's wearing any hip padding, which implies that the silhouette that we see on her throughout the series is entirely through corset reduction, which is the lesser comfortable way of achieving this. I'm not sure if this was a decision that was come to because the actress was comfortable lacing down quite a bit, or if this was a decision that was made because the character would be more likely to course it down. I have a theory, okay, okay, so True and Malady both have a very interesting, unnatural relationship to pain, but I think that extends towards the human physical perception. So she's made many a comment about this is not my face, she doesn't know where her own anatomy is. Mr. Vital organs say, no you didn't. No you didn't. Mm. And part of me would believe that she, as a questionably non-human entity would have looked at high fashion fashion plates of the time period, seen perhaps this body ideal and worked towards that with her own natural figure because she herself is not as susceptible to physical discomfort as the normal human being is. This is entirely conjecture and once again in order to have that be a decision that could be made 
the actress would have to be up for it. I think she would have been. Because the way that Laura Donnelly wears period clothes so expertly. Period clothes is not just about corsets. The other thing that a lot of people tend to get really hung up on with period dress is the skirts and the length of the skirts and how do you do anything and how do you run anywhere and how do you go up the stairs. Well, good friends, here at approximately 12 minutes and 59 seconds of episode 4, we see Madame Laura Donnelly walking up a flight of stairs in which she does not need to touch her skirt once. She does not need to pick up the hem and free her feet so that she may climb the stairs, but she does. What so many women have been doing for hundreds of years. But when you wear a long skirt and you walk up the stairs, you kind of have to step unevenly and you have to step out to the side. If you try and walk up the stairs and you catch the hem of your skirt with one step, inevitably you're just doomed. In kicking out your skirt to the side like that, you actually kick the skirt away from you as you walk up the stairs. But anyway, this is only an instinct that you develop after having worn a long skirt for a significant period of time and had to approach a set of stairs like a normal human being. I mean, yes, you can very easily just pick up the hem of your skirt and run up the stairs, but sometimes you have a bunch of stuff in your hands. You have to adapt so that your clothing serves you and doesn't get in the way. So you learn inevitably to walk up the stairs in this sort of fashion. And as we can see, the actress herself clearly has spent enough time wearing period clothing that she has developed this instinct. We see her character walking up the set of stairs very briskly, very competently, without touching her skirt. And we can see when she gets to the top of the stairs, she's walking what, if you're paying attention, would seem a little bit odd, but she's walking in the way that you're supposed to walk in order to get upstairs without pulling your entire skirt off. So those are my thoughts so far on the first four episodes of The Nevers on HBO. If you have not yet seen this show, I strongly, both professionally and personally, recommend that you check it out. It is so addictive, it is so detailed, so fascinating, but having this level of attention to detail in the historical reflection of the clothes in this series just adds a particular bit of perfection to the entire design, the entire visuals of the show. It's a little bit ironic that the clothes didn't have to be historically accurate. Oh, you know, it'll just be sci-fi, you know, they can kind of do what they want. But the fact that they did put so much effort into the actual historical research, and the fact that it turned out so good. Like, how can shows that are actually trying to be in a specific period of history not do this level of research? I think it is not a coincidence, in fact, that True's silhouettes and True's costumes throughout this series so far from what I've seen are the best. I mean, everyone's clothes are good, but hers are just the best. I don't think it's a coincidence that she's also the one who does by far the most physical stunt work as well. And I just find that such a good poke in the shoulder to all who claim that nothing can be done in period dress because this show proves it wrong and it brings me so much joy. Not only, of course, fierce women fighting in period clothes, but just fierce women poning things in general. I love it. I'm here for it. I'm down for it. Anyway, I hope if you are watching The Nevers that you are enjoying it as much as I am. If you're not, that's cool too. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend checking it out. Thank you again so much to HBO and The Nevers for sponsoring this video. I am so looking forward to seeing where this show goes, how it ends, and of course all the further physical feats we shall hopefully get to see in the coming few episodes. So thank you very much for joining me on this yet another little costumey adventure, and I shall see you on the next time.